All right, let's talk about troubleshooting. See if we can figure out some common problems or not so common problems. All right, so and a customer comes to you and says, well, my carburetor, my carburetor leaks while engine is off. So I say, oh, you know, I put the aircraft away, put it in the hangar, I come back, and there's a blue stain all over the cowling and the inside and down on the ground. Float level is too low. Float level is too low. I don't think so. Because if it's too low, then it's going to be nice and safe down the bottom of the float, isn't it? Float level? A defective float. All right, I like that one. Let's see, what else did I hear? Float level is too high. <coughs> okay, I heard too low. That's not so. Float level is too high. So in other words, the fuel in the float bowl is higher than where it should be. So it's reached the point where the discharge nozzle holes are, and it's stripping out the discharge nozzle. Which carburetor is, well, no, that's not. Okay, so that could be that. Um, two, what would, would it, would it here? Defective float. Okay. Um, defective float. What's the likelihood of that happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly a defective float. What else? Uh, the seat where the needle goes could be uh, have some debris in or something. Leaking needle and seat. Anybody else? Yeah, when, sometimes when they are parked at a slope. Parked on a slope, could be, yeah. So the uh, fuel can come into the air discharge. It really could. So that's almost the same problem as float level's too high. What can you do, if well, float level's too high, take it apart, reset it. If a defective float, put a new float. Leaky needle and seat, replace seat. Parked on a slope. Park it the other way. Park it the other way, yeah. <laughs> put some ramps in. <laughs> it's a Stromberg. <laughs> it's what they do. Why do they do that? Because they have leaky needles and seats. <laughs> All right. Let me see. Mixture lean at idle. How would I know that it's too lean at idle? Idle cut off and just dies. Okay, exactly. I like that one too. So, problem with um, pull back on the idle mix to idle cutoff, and you should see that rise and then die, but you don't. You just see it die. Most mechanics are just going to adjust it, and they're going to keep doing that until they get to the point where they walk in with the idle adjustment screw and go, "Hey, boss, this fell out." And you're like, "Okay, well, I think we've reached the end of our rich en enrichment limit." <laughs> And so now you might start looking for something else. Um, if it doesn't take a throttle, in other words, when you go to advance a throttle and it's backfiring and not taking it, that's bad too. And, and honestly, um, you know, in a perfect world, I want you guys to set up your Strombergs where you're kind of playing with the mixture and watching for that peak and watch it to fall. It's hard to do, especially on a windy day. It actually affects that flywheel out there. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm walking out and I'm actually just enriching it or leaning it, but whatever decide, just watch. Um, I, lean, I usually lean it out a little bit and then just watch and see if it'll give a little bit of rise when I do that. Um, if I don't, I just turn it back the way I had it and then I advance the throttle. If the throttle advances nicely, then I call it a job well done. So that's what I'm watching for on the Strombergs. So, okay, so now we know what we're talking about. So what could cause it to go lean at idle? Okay. Manifold air leak. Um, where where could it be leaking from? 
Yeah. Okay. More bushings. Bad gasket. Um, could have a war. Well, not on an airplane. We had that problem with our ground power unit. The little flange that you mounted to. You guys are, have a nice big quarter inch thick plate that Tyler welded last semester. Before that, it was that really thin one. We had a stack of cork gaskets, like two or three of them, trying to take away the, the waviness. It was ridiculous. So he fixed that. Uh, let me think. Well, what else? All right, there you go. Uh, oh, I like that. Bad gasket, a hole. It just wasn't set right. That is looking for that one. We had some student that didn't go to this A and P student who didn't go to this school had no idea how to do it right. They said something like, "I don't know. You just turn it out one and a half turns, and that's just I don't know. I guess that's what you do." Like, no, you got to pull the idle mix back and check it. They didn't know that. So. Warm, warm bushings on the throttle plate? Not on, you can't have, bush, there's no bushing on the throttle plate, throttle body you mean? Right here? No, on the, uh, yeah. Plate, uh, oh yeah, here. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. Uh, we wrote that. Warm bushings, bad gasket. Uh, let's see, they're, you know, different things. Um, out of adjustment. How about, um, let's see, idle jet. Idle jet or one of the discharge nozzles, they're very tiny. Maybe it has a little bit of sand in it or something. Um, we could idle air jet or maybe a blocked idle air bleed. So we can get all of that. Can you get the effects of any lean if the fuel is out of that enough? That is correct. And I think that's a QA. Where it actually there's a scenario where you can actually get enough fuel, but it because it's it's not atomized. The globules are so large that it's it acts like, it acts like it's not there. That would be the air bleed would be plugged in that instance, right? Could be, yep. Idle air jet, plugged or jet or the bleed. Say that. Uh, mixture to lean at cruise. Pilot that knows his aircraft or her aircraft really well might know it on CHT, EGTs are acting kind of funny. So same thing, manifold leak. There's a thing called sniffle valves. It's funny, you don't really get into them in school, but just like that. And what they are, they're little, uh, they're little valves in the intake manifold system Continental uses them because they use a common manifold that goes all the way around the outside. And the idea is if you over prime the engine, because you use the fuel injection system to over prime, that and it starts flooding out the intake manifold, that the fuel is just going to pull up there. You don't want that. So they actually have, it's like a the hole. And they just find their way and they drain out the hole. But there's little balls in there. And so when you start the aircraft up, the little balls suck up and the, now your leak is gone. So you can have bad sniffle valves. You can have um, on uh, especially Continentals, well, Lycoming does too. They use rubber couplings. Those rubber couplings are bad. Um, at the IA convention, the NTSB showed a Continental that had crashed, and uh, right after maintenance, and that's exactly what they found. Is Continental? They use a. They have a lot of couplings. I don't have a picture handy. Um, so out of every cylinder, you're going to have. Uh, some sort of uh, a part that bolts to the cylinder and then the other one bolts to the cylinder and they have this gap about yay big between them and then there's a rubber coupling you have to slide over them and you have to make sure you slide it over completely and they put two hose clamps on and that's rather easy to do uh, but then you get into the ones where they start to have turbochargers and now you have pressure behind them instead of vacuum and you can actually get enough pressure to blow them apart if you didn't put them together and that's exactly what happened on this aircraft somebody just missed put the hose clamp in the middle of space and uh, somewhere after they took off, the turbocharger kicked up enough pressure that it just, they got up to altitude and uh, just blew the, blew the pieces apart. Some of them aren't bolted to the cylinder, they're just pieces between rubber. So.
Gotta watch that. Um, float level too low. That's what Hannah was thinking now. She just got ahead of us. Right? Because it's too low, it's going to run a little bit lean. Uh, fuel, strainer, clogged. All right, there's no relief valve on those strainers. They get clogged. The engine just stops. There's no fuel is better than bad fuel. Obstructed fuel line. Oh, I could put... Um, clogged uh, fuel tank vent. So if you have a gravity-fed or gravity-fed airplane, you know, fuel's got to come down. There was actually an airworthiness directive on the Cessna 150s. Um, and the way they vented, they had a vent on the right wing, came out, comes out of the tank and below the wing. In the left wing, put a vented cap. And there was an AD, something got blocked in between them and didn't work. So now you have two vented caps and the underwing vents. You have three vents in those. But you lose a vent on a gravity feed, and it just, it just stops feeding, right? And if you have a low-wing airplane, is it going to be gravity-fed? No. no. So it's going to have a, a pressure pump. It'll actually start caving the wing in, trying to get fuel. I've heard the, people, the vacuum, of the vacuum creates this vacuum, starts sucking the wing. I've heard people have told me firsthand, like, it is crazy when you look out, oh, the wing is sucked down, and, uh, you know, and they, they land real quick, and, you know, they pop the thing, and bang, and it bangs. So, yeah, that really does happen. I had a, I had a client one time, I don't make me think of this, it was an old, uh, it's a Fairchild, and uh, it used an inverted six, and we just finished the annual, and uh, he came to get the airplane, it was like, you know, I'm the last one there, Friday night, on and on, and, um, and so he comes to get it, and, and he went to take off, but the thing died. You know, it would idle fine, but every time he advanced the throttle, it, it wouldn't go. And so, you know, take the fuel, and fuel just wasn't, we weren't getting a good run of fuel. And so I thought, well, you know, me and Shop Air, I'll just, you know, take the fuel caps off and blow a little bit back and just see if it, it, it flows. And, and I did that, and you could hear the bubble in the tank. And then when I took the Shop Air out, man, it, it just came out like a fire hose. I'm like, okay. There was clearly a blockage somewhere. So we need to investigate this and find the blockage and fix it. And he goes, ah, I'm good. <laughs> Let's put that was back on. It'll be fine. I'm like, well, it can't be fine. That's nah, fine. Guess it was fine. Um, but there are things called finger strainers. It doesn't strain fingers. It would strain fingers out. Um, but it's you know, shaped like a finger, but it's just a, a mesh that's inside the fuel tank to keep parts from wrapping. But a rag would wrap around it or something and get that. All right, so let's see. If you had a gravity-fed system, could you put a pump in the tank? Put a what? A pump in the tank, just to be on the safe side? Not if it's not approved. I wouldn't. Gravity, gravity for the most part works. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was an AD out once on gravity, but I pulled it out. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a few more things. Let's see. What if the mixture is too rich at idle? Clogged air bleed. Mm, probably not too rich. Let me think. I want to think about that one. Okay, mixture too rich at idle. If we have a clogged air bleed, well, the air bleed, it's not that the air bleed is necessarily giving you the, the, the ratio of fuel to air. So it's really not going to do that um, unless the Globules are so big that they're not atomizing, but on idle, probably not. Yeah. Uh, let me think. What do I want to do? Okay. We haven't talked about fuel pumps yet, but fuel pressure too high. If 
it had more than one. I don't idol. see that much on carbs. You had more than more than one idol jet. One of the idol jets could be blocked. Uh, but we're too rich, so that would cause it to go too lean. Of course, idol mix. Ready for the number one answer? Primer not locked. So primer, now you guys all know what a primer is because you ran the grand power unit. It's that plunger thing. You unlock it, you pull it out, and you push it in and it injects fuel. And what happens is if it's not down and locked, and if it's out a little bit, there's check balls in there. And it, it opens up the check balls, and what it does is it allows the low pressure manifold to put a suction on that line that goes right through the primer and back around up to the tank, and it just starts sucking fuel right through the whole system and adds a little, uh, another little idle jet to the system, and so it's going to run too rich. How do you fix that? Well, you really got to lean out that carburetor to get it. So. <laughs> then you have to label the aircraft. Must run with it unlocked because I've set it up that way. Uh, okay. Uh, we can do mix, uh, mix to rich at cruise. What's an AMC? Automatic mixture control is not working. Float level too high. Um, uh, trying to pick out the stuff on the carburetors you're working on. The more complicated car carburetors, the economizer valve could be misset. Ooh, I like this one. Accelerating pump, check valve. Um, bad, let's say bad. Wouldn't that be both then? No, because one is always going oh, yeah. in. So only one has to be bad. All right, I think we can kind of call it a day on that one. All right, I'll ask you guys some questions. We've spent two weeks talking about this stuff. That's a lot of information, isn't it? But before you get freaked out, we had to recirculate around over and over again on how to set carburetors. How do you turn off a Stromberg carbureted engine? Key. With the key, and what's the RPM going to do? Just drop. Just drop. What does that mean? It's, <laughs> it's what it's supposed to do. All right. <coughs> how do you shut off a car, uh, an aircraft equipped with a Marvel Shebler carburetor? The what? Idle cutoff, and what color knob is the idle cutoff? Red. Red one. <laughs> that one. And when I pull it all the way out, what is the engine supposed to do? <laughs> RPM should rise about 25 to 50 RPM, and then the engine dies. All right. Uh, what was that? Something else I was going to make. And what if it doesn't? All right. What if it rises? Oh, that's what I get. I get a lot of. Well, isn't it supposed to rise 25 to 50 degrees? I hope not. Okay, that's. You have to think that through. So, by the time between the time I pull that knob out and the time it dies is going to be about. Oh, five seconds. 
Okay, so in five seconds, you're not going to see your exhaust gas temperature rise 25 to 50 degrees at an idle. It just isn't going to happen, so don't look for that. In fact, EGT doesn't even work that well down at that range. Stoichiometric mixture is, uh, is what numbers? 15 to 1. What is the 15 part? Air. Air. Okay. What is what does that mean stoichiometric? Oh, I heard that one. A chemi chemically balanced. Okay, um, chemically balanced, or uh, does it have an excess of air? No. Does it have excess of fuel. No. So neither excess. Okay, so we got all that. Um, and I asked you what stoichiometric was. Is is stoichiometric what I want in my engine? No. 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 What is that more appropriately? 12 to 1. 12 to 1 okay, so people say 12 to 1. I do believe there is now an instrument on the market somewhere, not approved for certified aircraft, but I think they make one for uh, experimentals that tells you the mixture ratio. So that'd be fun to have. What about my? What's that? Be easy to make okay. for him. <laughs> I'm back in the carved monkey days. Where I'm still trying to train a monkey to you know figure it out. So, okay. Um, okay, so we have our range of of mixtures. What is the leanest mixture I can possibly have that's still going to burn? Eight to one. What am I hearing? Leanest. 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 Eight, eight, to, eight to one. Did I hear? Is eight to one rich or lean? Rich. rich. So no, I'm talking about lean. What's the leanest I can go? Eighteen to one. Hey, good news. I think one of your, your book, your textbook, does not use eight and eighteen. It uses different numbers. But okay, I like eight and eighteen because other books say that, and I can remember they, they, that one. So, so uh, that is eighteen to one. Is the leanest? What's the richest? Eight to one. If I have something burning at eight to one and I have something burning eighteen to one, which is gonna burn the slowest? Ah, you guys are good. The leanest will burn slower. Um Okay, we talked about peak power. And best economy. Where is best economy going to happen? Lean of peak. Ooh, lean of peak. Lean of peak what? That was good. Okay, now we're talking about temperatures. And we're talking about exhaust gas temperatures. So if we remember our chart, we'll remember that. We have our exhaust gas temperature. And we had our cylinder head temperatures. I know. Well, now I got to go view with left panel and then blue and then that work. I think I kind of did that right. Uh, go by memory. This is peak EGT and peak cylinder head temp. Don't forget that happens about 50 degrees on this side. And over here on the lean side of EGT is where we're going to get our best economy. Well, how can I remember that? Well, that's easy. Are you going to get better economy if you're at peak rich, which is adding more fuel, or lean, which is subtracting more fuel? Lean. Okay, subtracting more fuel makes sense. That'd be lean of peak, so I like that one. Um, so speaking of lean operations, what do continental and light combing say about operating lean of peak? Not Above, let me see. Above 75% Say that again. Um, when, when, I'm going to lump them together because one was like 60 and one was 70, but what, what do continental light combing say about operating lean of peak? Don't do it above 75% of power. Anybody have the exact wording that I said? Oops. Uh, 
Yeah, that's where I want to go. I think they said that. Uh, let me see. Thank you for my exact quote. So leading assessed to 182, I had operation at peak EGT is authorized at 65% power or less. Here's a quote on the SESTA 182, Continental Engine. Operation on the lean side of peak EGT is not authorized. So what does Continental say about peak, uh, lean of peak? Not, at all. not authorized out of this 182 POH. Um, let me see. I can't find my Lycoming notes. Lean Excel, PGGT. Does peak EGT below 75%? Peak, but yeah, I don't think. Never you, lean beyond 150. That's rich of peak. So thank you. So what do Continental Lycoming say about Lean of Peak operation? That would be a not authorized. But don't they say to lean aggressively at idle? That's a whole different issue. That's not, you're not using a peak, eat, peak you're down at idle. So, so all right, so what is, what is the, the answer going to be on that one? Not, do it. not authorized. People doing it? Nope. <laughs> yeah. In mining, it's authorized. What's that? In mining, it's authorized. It's authorized in yours? Yeah. I should probably so get rid of it. It's not authorized at max power, over 75%. Okay. You just have to buy a G1000. I know. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. <laughs> um, let's see. If I have a power enrichment, why do I have a power enrichment in my carburetor? To make up for the deficit of one increasing problem? No. Nope. Oh, I'm not there. To, uh, the Mr. Rich at, um, at higher RPM. Yeah, to automatically enrich in it whenever you're beyond cruise. Okay, so a power enrichment, or sometimes they're called an economizer, um, automatically enriches the mixture at high RPM settings to do what? Cooling and anti detonation. All right. Uh, how did I. How, how can, what's backfiring an indication of? Lean, lean mixture. Lean, okay, lean mixture. You forget about that. I can always take you out the ground power unit, pull on the, uh, pull the idle mix all the way out on a Stromberg and give it throttle. And what's it going to do? Pop, pop. Uh, where is a carburetor designed, if they designed it with power enrichment slash economizer and all that, where is it designed to run the leanest? Cruise is correct. Uh, considering all the things that help give us power, uh, what atmospheric conditions, what are good things? Cold. Cold, Cold. Cold. okay. Low humidity. Low humidity. Sea level or below. Sea level or below, okay, so density altitude. So the bad things then would be? High altitude. altitude. High, altitude. High heat. High heat. High humidity. High humidity. Okay. What is the standard day? Fifty-nine degrees Celsius. I don't think that sounded right. Forty degrees latitude. Wait. Fifteen degrees Celsius. Fifty. Okay. I heard fifty-nine degrees Celsius. Which is fifty-nine. Okay, and uh, at what pressure? 14.7 PSI, okay. You sure? Because I think one of my questions last four weeks was something about, uh, I think I had on there 14.7 inches of mercury, and I think several people picked that one. On the, on the drone certificate test that I took, yeah? it was atmospheres, so it was, it was one atmosphere. Well, is it just supposed to make it simpler for drone pilots, I guess? I guess it must be, yeah. <laughs> when I think atmospheres, I think scuba diving, and then I can <laughs> equate it there. 
which is 30, 33 feet of seawater. <laughs> At 40 degrees north latitude, all right. Um, as air density decreases, what does that mean? Am I going up or down in altitude? Up. All right, and my power, the engine's going to do what? Decrease. Decrease, okay. I want to modify my carburetor so I get more power. So to do that, I'm just going to get out my drills and my drill gun. And I am going to drill out the main air bleed. Am I going to get more power? No. No, no okay. What if I drill out the, um, main, ma yes. the main metering jet? Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> So the size of the main air bleed, um, is it going to run richer or leaner then? Leaner. Leaner if I increase the air bleed. All right, so I got some symptoms in here about floats being up or down. If you follow the Lycoming like, mean, Continental's uh, directives of not running, uh, of running rich of peak and you fill out the main air bleed, then mm -hmm. Maybe. All right, so who has not done the Stromberg on the carburetor bench yet? All right, there's a question in here on how to do it. So I spell it out for you, but I'm just going to warn you right now. I'm going to give you an average float size, or an average, you know, where the float, float size, float level, I'll tell you where it should be. And I'm even going to go so far as to remind you that it's a five to one ratio. You should be able to come up with the answer on this. So I say float level of Stromberg is called out to be 0.406, which it is, from the parting surface, and the check reveals that it's a certain number of inches, and one unit of shin alters the unit five level, should shims be added or removed. All right, and then I say, oh yeah, the last problem, what size shim should you use? All right. Um, What limits the amount of fuel that can actually flow from a f the float bowl to the discharge nozzles on the idle side? Not the main metering jet. The idle, 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 idle. I said, what, what limits the amount of fuel that flows from the fuel bowl to the discharge nozzles on the idle circuit? The what? No, what limits the amount of fuel? The idle metering jet. Idle metering jet is correct. And then you can set the idle mixture needle from that point. But idle metering jet is what I'm looking for there. Um, what happens if I get a clogged main discharge nozzle? I don't know why it would clog, but let's just play along. Die. Say that again. Yes. Uh, Interesting. So what would it do? No, I mean, oh, dive above. Dive would it run fine at idle? Yeah. Sure. Good job. So it would run just fine at idle, and every time you go to transition it, it would just die. Let's turn it around. What happens if you have clogged idle metering jet? Start. But if you could get it start. Start. It would start. Just it would die. You need you need a primer. <laughs> but it would do what? It would probably die at idle. So about our, what 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 RPM would it keep dying at? About eight hundred or so, or five fifty. No, it's going to idle at five fifty. About a thousand. So every time you got near about a thousand RPM, it would start up but only if you had the throttle open a lot and it would idle above 1,000, and every time you got to 1,000, it would just die. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, we talked a lot about excessive wear around the carburetor throttle bushings. that one. 
What are the two types of accelerating systems? Can I use an accelerating well to prime an engine to start it? No. Can I use an accelerating pump to prime an engine to start it? Yes. Kind of. Okay. If I have an AMC, what's that stand for? And what's that made up of? Bellows. bellows. What happens if I have a hole in the bellows and I go up in altitude? It's going to what? It's going to run rich. Why? Because the AMC is broken and now the carburetor just acting like a normal old carburetor. Doesn't know any better. Which carburetor has a back suction mixture control? Hey, all right, Stromberg, you guys. And well, as long as you know what that is, you're good. Let's see here. Air bleed enrichment type of economizer. We talk much about that. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. If I read the question, I think you guys can. If you read read that question carefully, <laughs> it makes perfect impact. What? Um, carburetor ice is most likely to happen when. Yes, um, I was actually looking for an engine speed, so sorry. What engine speed will, will carburetor ice most likely happen? Uh, oh, I can, could happen at any speed. Partial. Cruise, full throttle, partial. idle. <laughs> I didn't say all right. I gave you some other choices. <laughs> Is it any speed, cruise, full, or idle? So partial thr partial is not an option in this test. <laughs> Any speed. Well, should we pull back the notes? Let's see here. Depends on what kind of ice it is. If it's impact ice, Ah, I wrote partial throttle. Yeah, you did. Uh -huh. Okay. Which is idle. <laughs> there we go. Oh, I see it now. Oh, there it is. Idle. So I wrote it. Blue, blue is so important. Right, so before, uh, before we take off as a pilot, or I'm doing an annual on an airplane, that sounds more realistic this class. So whenever I'm doing an annual on an airplane, um, you, know, you can't delegate an annual, so I would have to go get the annual uh, the aircraft and do a pre-run inspection. So I always want to know how it's running. So as the IA, I'll go get it, warm up the engine. I'm going to uh, check a couple of things. Um, one, I'm going to take it up to around 1,700 RPM, and I'm going to check both my mags, right? Make, turn off one, make sure it runs on just the left, make sure it runs on just the right. And when I do that, what's the RPM going to do when I go from both to just left? Drop a little bit. I go back to both. It goes back up. I go to the other side. What should it do? Drop down. Okay, then I'm going to go back to both. Then, uh, then I'm going to take the carb heat and pull it out. What should I see? Drop. I push it back in. It should go back up. Then I'm going to run it up to max RPM. And if I have a fixed pitch propeller, what am I going to see? You might know. How close to redline am I going to get? We'll talk about that later. Not very, not, not too close. Not too close to the fixed pitch. If I have a constant speed, what's it going to do? Get up to right, up, right up to and touch that redline. So constant speeds will go right up to redline. But because of the drag at the higher speed, because of the pitch? With a constant speed? Yeah. No? No, with a, con with a constant. With the fixed pitch? Why does it do that? 
Uh, it has to do with the angle of attack hitting the blade, which okay. changes so it forward back. with forward movement. Okay. Uh, anyway, the whole point on there was something about uh, carb heat. What actually limits the amount of fuel air that goes into the carburetor? Venturi does. So as it's a throttle to a point, but then the ultimate restrictor is the <coughs> Venturi. Well, I'm glad I mentioned the thing before. So uh, when you're running up a fixed pitch propeller and you run it wide open, you're not going to see a red line. You're going to see a different number. And that number is called static RPM. And so you actually run it up and, you know, red line is say 2750 and I only get 2350. It's a long way, right? Okay, so that should concern you a little bit until you look at the type certificate data sheet and it literally actually has on there static RPM and it should be between this and this. And you're like, oh, look, it was right between those. That's called static RPM. So if I am running, I put a new carburetor on, uh, on an aircraft and I bolt it up and I want to take it out and I do a static run RPM and I don't get the throttle, the, the RPM that I need, it's low on RPM. What could that be a cause of? What, what could have happened? Uh, could be a bit lean, but what setting do you have as a mechanic at the off idle settings, wide open? that you can adjust on a carburetor. Throttle adjustment, okay. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it's... True, except if you put it together right, what did you do before you took it out and ran it? You checked it. You checked it. So let's assume you did that part right. And it is reaching full throttle, but that was good. That was actually a good, good one there, so. Number one, it's not opening wide up all the way. I like that. What else? On the, your linkage towards your throttle um, the knob in, inside of the airplane, that is not set correctly. Right, that's what he said. Okay. But I said that's a good thought. I hadn't thought of that one, but something else. Are there any adjustments that you can make outside of connecting the throttle arm for off idle? The manual mixture control? The idle mixture control. And what circuit does that control? The idle. So what effect does that have at wide open throttle? None. None. Okay. So what? Just checking. <laughs> Did I pass? So what, what adjustments do we have with the carburetor at wide open throttle? Manual mixture control. All right. Assuming that we set that up correctly, what position should it be in anyway? Full rich. Full rich. And at full rich, should it reach its static RPM? Yeah. Unless you're at a high altitude or something that day. But actually, I take that back because, believe it or not, if, if you were at a higher altitude setting, then your aircraft's going to lose some power, right? So would that be a problem and that cause you to not get your static RPM? Yes. It wouldn't because the propeller is fighting the same air. So it has less air to fight, so it always maintains equal. It's kind of weird, isn't it? So you never have that issue. You always get your static RPM as long as everything's set up correctly. So what else could be causing it? Do you have the carbine? That is an excellent thing. Um, I did, actually. I'll put it back in. Okay. I wasn't thinking that, but boy, that was a good one. I'm going to make sure that's not one of the right answers. Let's see here. Now, how about something I talked about tonight? Uh, leaky gasket. No. Wrong, uh, wrong, wrong gasket. Wrong gasket. Yeah, it could have a wrong gasket in there. I know, they're hard to think of now, but when you only have four possibilities, and that's one of them, you'd be like, I'm not. There you go. So, um, all right, manifold pressure. At idle, do I have a high manifold pressure or a low manifold pressure? Low. Low. low manifold pressure. What happens to manifold pressure as I advance the throttle? It increases. 
Goes, okay, closer to atmospheric. atmospheric. Very good. What happens to that manifold pressure if I don't touch the throttle, but I start messing with the manual mixture and I get it to idle faster by doing this? What, the manifold pressure go up or down? Decreases. It goes down. Gets more of a vacuum. Excellent. All right. So that's 34 questions there. Q and A. The heck? A lot. I wonder if I rewrote the test. Stand by. So I got, uh, yeah, 34 and 50 through 86. So kind of a lot of questions. That's good news. You get to miss plenty. All right. Any questions on? So I guess if you, any doubts, just watch all the videos again. There's, there's only about 20-some hours worth. <laughs>